Welcome to Microdosing Table Talks, the world's first podcast dedicated exclusively to learning more about, you guessed it, microdosing. For those new to the community, microdosing is the practice of consuming a psychedelic substance in tiny subhallucinogenic doses with the purpose of enhancing one's quality of life. While this practice has its roots in ancient and indigenous traditions, there's still a lot to learn and a great deal of mystery to uncover. Here at Microdosing Institute, our mission is to merge and honor this ancient wisdom with the growing body of scientific knowledge. In the podcast, we'll introduce you to experts in the psychedelic space to bring you a better understanding of how microdosing can truly serve us, both as individuals and humanity at large. Before we begin, we'd like to extend a thank you to our friends at microdose.nl for sponsoring this episode. Microdose.nl is Europe's number one shop for all of your microdosing needs. For our community members based in the European Union, check out microdose.nl before your next microdosing cycle. Now, let's go ahead with today's episode. So on this podcast, uh, the Microdosing Institute interviews guests who make important contributions to the microdosing space. And I'm here today with one of the pioneering microdosing coaches of these times, uh, Ana Maria Badila. Ana Maria is a Romanian-born psychedelics educator and personal growth enthusiast. She has a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in special education and always loved learning about the human potential and the depths of our psyche. In 2017, psychedelics introduced her to a transformative journey, shifting her understanding of the human psyche from intellectual to embodied wisdom. And now as a psychedelic guide and a microdosing coach, she empowers others to find inner freedom and more. You may know her from her educational platform, Microdosing Guru, and Odin, the first journal for microdosing with systemic tracking, and the Microdosing Stories podcast, which is relatively new. So welcome, Ana Maria. <laughs> nice to have you here. Thank you for having me, Jacobian. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's so great that we sort of finally get to have this conversation recorded a bit more official after uh, knowing each other for quite some time and uh, spending some time together in Amsterdam as well. So um, yeah, I'm already grateful. Totally. I feel like... Um the conversations we've had so far have been such, um, um, so, so amazing and so fruitful. And, uh, I wish we had like a record button then, but yeah, we back then. True, true, true. I, I, same here. I, I got a lot out of, out of that. And, um, well, let's see what's, what comes on the table today, right? Um, All right. But yeah. I, I just want to get out of the way the fact that even though I do podcasts, I'm a bit nervous. So just bear with me until I get over that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I agree. Like for me, it's always sort of the start of these things. It's like as if there's some sort of hiccup that you have to go through. And then uh, at some point it takes off. I'm sure our listeners will know because in the beginning I usually stumble a bit and then it's and then things straighten out and smoothen out and yeah, we're just floating in there. So, but yeah, thank yeah. you for sharing yeah. that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, I would like to know, you know, um, yeah. And also for our audience. So back in 2017, actually microdosing was still a bit of a niche. And, uh, that's also when we started our platform because we felt like there was so, little information available for people and so many people didn't know that you could actually microdose um, that it had benefits and then people who wanted to do it didn't know how to approach it um, and that's also when you uh, came around but yeah I'm just curious to know how did psychedelics come onto your path and you know what inspired you to um, yeah to actually start guiding others with them as well mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I've always been on this journey of finding myself, finding, um, you know, how far I can go outside of my comfort zone. And um, I was actually, before finding psychedelics, uh, listening to a lot of Brené Brown. 
And um, I could understand a lot of the things that I learned in university about the human psyche, defense mechanisms, shadow, and all that type of stuff. And I was working through it. But as soon as as soon as I I, I found psychedelics, they just unlocked something something for me that I didn't know was I didn't know it was possible. And I want to kind of mention the first experience I had, which was with um, MDMA, um, that will land this for for you because. Um, so my whole life I've been trying to look good for others. And so that would translate in things like I would, um, show in a certain way, I would speak in a certain way. I would like in social settings, I would be very, um, like frozen, I would say. Um, and that would translate in when I wanted to go dancing as a student, uh, and I could never move my body and no matter how much alcohol I drank, it felt like I was still petrified. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, in 2017, I moved in with a good friend of mine and she was a DJ back in the day and we, she would go out to clubs, to DJs. And she gave me this thing and all of a sudden people around me in the club disappeared and I could just feel the music in my body and I started moving and I had so like I enjoyed it so much and I felt so free that I was like oh my god like this fear that was petrifying me before that was all in my head is just gone and I I can actually feel the music and I'm enjoying this so much and so that's when I realized that there is a, such a big connection be between uh, my mind and my body, and I can actually use psychedelics to unlock some of these um, perceptions about reality I had that were limiting me and holding me back from doing things that I really wanted. Um, so as soon as I did that, I was like, I need to try more of this. So I tried LSD, um, psilocybin, um, I joined a group in Vancouver and it just took off. I, I found sides of me that I didn't know existed. And then I also shed a lot of this, you know, people pleaser persona. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. This is, this is, yeah. And I think this is a very universal experience. Um, what you were just describing with MDMA. It's uh, also when I think of, I, I did a lot of, dancing but i will say i was also very aware of myself right and that is already like the mind was definitely present all this time and yeah. looking back i see that was the case for so many people you know how often actually much later i ended up going to psychedelic festivals where people were taking well taking or sometimes not taking anything but psychedelics and they would dance in the most creative ways and they would just you know not care about anything or anyone and just really let their body be creative and connect with the music so yeah it shows how many different layers of our selves can can come out um, depending on the drug or depending on, you know, how much we're actually just not let our minds be uh, in the way of that. Yeah. yeah and, and one of the things that I realized, um, you know, using psychedelics for getting answers or transformation or moving through my blockages is that no matter how much I, I'm trying to think my way through a problem or through blockages, I can't. And so, um, with psychedelics, what happens is that like things melt away and all of a sudden I can see differently. And that's why I, uh, even in my bio, I said that all these things that I knew about myself and human psychology and psyche, they became embodied wisdom because they were not just understood here, but they were felt in like viscerally in my body. And I could actually be this new person that I always wanted to be. I could think like that. I could feel like that. I could act like that. I didn't have to imagine it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So the connection to your body through feeling it became also a knowing and then it became an acting out of that. So then it became also living in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It was a beautiful journey. 
Yeah, yeah. And what made you, um, was it then clear that you wanted to um, work with these psychedelic medicines for others or that you wanted to offer them tools to, you know, like, yeah, support them in, in a similar way as what you've, uh, what you've discovered or uh, was something else needed to get to that point? <laughs> Yeah, like going back to your original question, like how did I start microdosing? Um, so as I said, I, I started doing other psychedelics, uh, mushrooms and LSD. And um, in on LSD, I actually had this beautiful experience where I felt like my whole purpose of being on this earth is to allow creative energy to pour through me and manifest into this world. And it just felt like my th that's the purpose, like that's the whole point. Uh, of being here and I was like so how do I do that like that was the first thing and with that question in mind like I kept I kept looking at my reality in different ways to find the answer that was my way of integrating that experience and uh, there was this thing that uh, came onto my radar which was microdosing and at that time, I was doing marketing and branding for a cannabis company. And I was like, oh, microdosing, I can use it for my creative projects because why not, you know? And um, I started researching. I read a lot on the Internet. I found, um, you know, I read about the F James Fadiman protocol um, and all these resources. And I didn't even know where to find a microdosing kit. I didn't even know how a microdosing kit looked like. So what I started doing was um, just researching a lot and then reading about people's experiences and how to do it properly. And um, I started talking to people um, about microdosing. And I remember I was at this house party, a very strange environment or place like not my thing, but a friend invited me to. And I started talking to this random girl about my new passion, which was microdosing. And she's like, oh my God, I actually work for a microdosing company. They sell microdosing kits uh, through the phone. I was like, oh, really? This is so easy. Like, how did I find it? Like, <laughs> So all of a sudden I set the intention and then the, the universe kind of brought to me all these um, synchronicities. And I was like, okay, I'll try it. So I ordered uh, my first microdosing kit. It was just, I wasn't impressed. It came in a zip bag, um, just capsules. I was like, oh, that's it? Okay, okay cool. <laughs> um, and then I took the first microdose and it was 100 milligrams. And I've decided to take it at work because I wanted to use it for creative purposes. And... That was not a good experience. That was a, a very bad experience because like I had the intention, but I, I knew little about set and setting and I knew little about um, the fact that 100 milligrams might not work for me because it might not be my, my dose. And because I had such a bad experience, I, I, I almost gave it up. But I'm like, okay, I need to find a solution because everyone is raving about this thing and clearly I'm doing something wrong. So let's try again. Um, and somewhere on Reddit, I found, I read someone saying that maybe it's just too much. So I broke down the capsules and I actually started by taking 25 milligrams and I incrementally increased my dosage. <clears throat> and then I realized that, okay, so... I have to find my sweet spot and then I want to track my experience. And so from this, the, the, the journal kind of emerged because that was my way of tracking my experience. I loved collecting my personal data. And then because I started talking to all my friends about them uh, and the experience and I joined the meetup group, um, it just became this thing that people came to me for. So they came to me to buy microdoses and to buy the journal and to uh, look for guidance. And so I, I've decided to take a course um, and just like one from one thing to another, I ended up doing what I do now, but it was never intended to, I was never in, like, I didn't 
envision myself being a coach or anything. That's why I started the Instagram as the microdosing guru and nothing, not something like, you know, microdosing coach. And I did all the things that I felt they were interesting around microdosing. Yeah. Yeah, it was more like you were sharing your process with the world and your discoveries, and that resonated with people. Yeah, yeah, and and in that in that um, on that channel, I did the the microdosing challenge initially, and then I did you know interviews with people to find out about their experiences, and I met such amazing people that I became friends with, and so it just became this what it is now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, can you just real quick, because we had, um, you already enlightened me with this a piece of um, explanation, but I would love to share it with our listeners as well. So um, what does microdosing guru really stand for? Why did you pick that name? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, so <clears throat> I know that You know, in today's uh, understanding, a guru is um, someone that you follow for guidance, for wisdom, and um, you should abide by whatever they say because they ha they hold the truth. But in reality, a guru is just someone that sheds light. It never gives you the answers. And so from that understanding, I, I like to look at the microdosing guru platform is um, a platform that offers, sheds light and asks questions that makes you think about your circumstance in a different way, but not necessarily tells you what you, uh, your, your answer, because I don't have your answer. Nobody else has your answer. Um, and I think nowadays we are addicted to, <clears throat> to this idea that um, I'll find a perfect formula that works for me or I'll find a perfect fr protocol that works for me or I'll find um, um, the answers s somewhere else instead of um, instead of taking a process, even the process of microdosing and attuning to it and learning from it and, and seeing what it's teaching you. So yeah, a guru is someone that sheds light, basically. Uh, it's not, you know, a truth holder for you to kind of go to yeah. towards. Yeah. No, I think this is so, this is so important. Like the nuances oftentimes in language and, and um, yeah, this idea of shedding light on microdosing. And now I would actually love to know, so you as someone who sheds light on, you know, the practice of microdosing, um, what is a really important aspect or what is something that you really feel like this is what people need to understand before they start microdosing? So what do you really feel like this is what I need to shed light on? Mm -hmm. Oh, there are a few things actually. So <clears throat> like we often say that microdosing is not a magic pill, right? It doesn't fix your problems. It doesn't give you the answers. And I encourage people because I, I see a lot of people coming to me saying like, what's the protocol I should follow or what's the dosage for me or what's this or what's that? And they're just looking at a formula that worked for someone else to incorporate into their life to work, to work for them as well. But the thing is that microdosing, like anything new in, you incorporate into your life is something you need to attune to and then it just gives you information as much as you lean into it and then the more you lean into it the more it reveals things to you and so this process of constant communicating with microdosing and I call it a skill because it is a skill you basically take it you bring it into your life and then you practice it even more and then new layers unfold and you discover new things and you have the answers and I, I think that people should understand that if they are committed to microdosing or if they are committed to this new practice, they have to be fully committed, meaning that mm -hmm. they won't have the answer right away and they have to listen carefully. So that's, that's the thing. Like, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I explain it or I'm, I make myself understood, but, but that, that's, that's the thing I see is that it's not going to it's not going to give you the answers if you're not investing in it your energy and your attention yeah yeah, yeah. 
Do, yeah. Do you, yeah, it, do you it, find it, it, it? Do you find it the same way? Yeah, it resonates a lot. Um, I talk a lot about also in terms of going into dialogue with this psychedelic medicine and the dialogue um, asks from you that you give it some space to speak and that you give it space and time and that you, like you said, you invest in it. Um, that could mean anything from, yeah, like being humble, letting go of your expectations, uh, also from setting an intention for yourself. So kind of knowing what you want and what you need and what you want clarity on for yourself. Like also the commitment to, um, to wanting to understand yourself better. So, uh, like we, we cannot just go and say, oh, I want this answer. Or I want this fixed without like, you know, not looking at all the rest of who you are, because that's where, that's what plays a part in this. So, um, yeah, it's it's really like a dialogue with the medicine uh, or a dialogue with yourself through these medicines. And that uh, that's a process also. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, yeah. And and just just to maybe give, give an example from my experience, um when I started microdosing, I knew that I wanted to let go of my control issues and um like the way I, I like controlling my environment is by um, envisioning what's going to happen and only allow that into my life. Um, and if it doesn't, then I either won't accept it, I won't see it, or I will get mad at, at it. And what was what was being shown to me over and over again was that I'm too rigid. Like I'm just too freaking rigid. I need I need to loosen up and and um, you know things will come into my awareness and emotions and feel so so i would ask for for being open and for for um feeling more accepting and obviously when you ask for that you're being brought you're being given things that will trigger you because if you're rigid then <laughs> you're not accepting <laughs> basically and so it, it was a battle uphill almost but um as soon as i realized that I ask for it and it's being given to me um, in a way that I didn't envision it and that's where my controlling is, then, yeah, it was much easier to work with it and let go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, life throws you these things, these opportunities to get rid of your rigidness. But of course, it's not always in the way that we envision that. That's the whole point. And sometimes what I like about uh plant medicine also in particular but i think also in life sometimes you get things that are even better like you get these opportunities or these big learning moments that you wouldn't have picked out of all the opportunities that you can imagine no you get something completely different but it turns out to be the best way to learn or to be the totally, best way to yeah. practice mm. exactly practicing because in the practice is where you embody this new person you want to be yeah 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 and it does require trust as well this is what comes to mind like a lot of trust um yes indeed but i think that 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 trust and confidence um it 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 at least in, in myself it came by by trying and failing and seeing that i can actually come back and try again and that it wasn't the end of the, the world if things didn't go my way. Yeah. And so the feeling that every, everything will work out perfectly in the end, um, it's what allowed me to f be more trusting. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm curious, though, so, um, how did you... Because what we're vis what we're seeing here is also this this cycle of learning, right? This cycle of learning, and from the experience and from even the failure comes more trust and comes more knowing that there will be another opportunity and it's actually already okay. And um, um, yeah, so this brings me to this topic of the hero's journey, which I wanted to talk to you about, of course. Um, 
but maybe you can explain it a bit better. And I, I think we already made a start here with, you know, what we just started talking about. So this this process of learning and failing and seeing things in a different light and see that it actually works out for you. Yeah, the hero's journey. Um, yeah, and so for the listeners who don't know what the hero's journey is, because it's, um, it's yeah, it's, it comes up a lot in the space of... Um, um, coaching, therapy, trans bas basically transformational processes, right? So, um, but yeah, I would really love for you to um, to talk a bit more about that. Yeah, so basically the hero's journey is this, um, it actually was derived from, you know, Joseph Campbell's um, book, which uh, I think it was called um, The Hero with a Thousand um, faces and he identified that yeah, he was obsessed with um, you know uh, myths and um, a, a Native American culture and he he looked at how different characters kind of follow the same journey which is a circular one so they go from from their known environment uh, into the unknown and they return back home into that known with more wisdom because in the unknown, they they fought their demons. So basically, that's that's what it is. And I feel like like I love it so much because um, my like I've I've gone through multiple circles like this, like smaller and bigger heroes journey. But the bigger one for me was when I left Romania. Uh, I moved to Canada. I. I found psychedelics and I found my, like, I found my demons and then I came back to Romania. And, um, like, just to give a bit of background is that in Romania, I was educated and I grew up in a very um, <clears throat> sheltered environment and it was religious and very rigid and very strict and I could actually not be myself. And the person that I knew myself to be was not accepted. Uh, was not allowed, was always, you know, harshed and asked to to kind of tone it down. And so I developed this people-pleaser persona that I mentioned earlier that was like kind of petrifying me. <clears throat> mm. um, and so I wanted to break free from that. And a lot of things happened that moved me over the threshold that I was like, I'm done with this life in Romania. I don't want to be here anymore. And so I moved to Canada, and in Canada it was so amazing because all the noise, all the influences from family, friends, um, what I knew here to be true about life was not valid there anymore. And I, it was like a blank canvas, and I remember this vivid moment where I was going grocery shopping. I was like, I don't know who Anna is. Like, I don't know what I like. I don't know I, what I don't like. I, I know nothing about myself. And here I am in this land where everything is different from, you know, the way the food looks like and the, the everything, you know. And I have this opportunity to find who, who am I. And so um, I was on that journey for quite a bit. Um, as I mentioned, I, I looked at Brené Brown and her work and, you know, a lot of the things that um, that she says resonated with me. And then I found psychedelics and I saw in this psychedelic journeys all the things that were holding my, me back and the unresolved trauma and the pain that I was carrying and um, the way I was showing up and all the... Um, like the victim mentality I was living in and, um, you know, all these things. And it, 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 was, it was beautiful to be in that space and to fight the demons because what I, what I mostly did in my journeys was I reconnected with my childlike um, uh, energy and my joy and I healed through play because that's what needed to come out for me to to actually enjoy living life. Yeah. And then um, last year, um, you know, I, I left Canada. I moved to Costa Rica to create a women's retreat and do all these things. And then I traveled to US and I 
couldn't go back neither to Canada, I didn't like it in Costa Rica, and I couldn't stay in the U.S. So the only option left for me was to come back home. Mm -hmm. And I came back to Romania, um, and the figure that always what felt the most oppressive was my mom. So, she, like, she represented that, like, rigid uh, figure. Mm -hmm. And healing my wounding with her, it was, it's the most beautiful thing here because... Well, I brought her medicine, I brought her into my space and I showed her all the things, the weird things I do and she never judged me for anything. Like she's so amazed and uh, impressed and she loves everything I do and like she, she sees me now for my essence. Um, and there was this weight that kind of was lifted off me because I always felt like the choices I was making were to to please her or to in in a way, and now that's not there anymore, and I can just allow my child to. And so Romania doesn't feel this oppressive anymore because I have a different perspective of it, and I can see the opportunities. Whereas when I left, it was all like, no, there is nothing here for me. It's like a desert. Nothing can bloom here. But it was all because that's how I felt inside. And so I had to go through that to come back to this. And like, I don't know if I'll stay here necessarily, but yeah, it, it just, it, 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 it's interesting to see the shift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You brought all the parts of yourself back there. Oh. And then it reflects your uh, inner world. It's also reflected outside. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the thing I love about the hero's journey is that we are all heroes in our um, life and we are given certain challenges because we can actually overcome them and become like the bigger the challenges, the bigger the hero. And you are given this because you are the only way, the only one that can, that can overcome them. And you can tell that story. No one else can do it for you. Because you are experiencing that and you're showing everyone that's, that has maybe a similar path that it is possible. Yeah, yeah. So how important is it for a person to, to know their story, to understand their own story? So, not to go too metaphysical here, but um, I... Thing that like we are all consciousness and I think that the purpose of consciousness is to know itself and we do come into this world like whole and complete and we have everything we need but then we are boxed um, and we are boxed because we need contrast to learn about ourselves and so when we are boxed either by family environment or, or our biology or the way, you know, our chemistry works and things like that, we just get to, to, to experience this wholeness in nuances. And then the, um, when you experience it, experience it in nuances, you see the limitations. And then the whole point is to kind of expand outside of that, of those limitations. So say, for example, I'm one that's looking for um, love outside to be completed. Like if I come back to knowing that I'm already whole and complete and I don't need anyone to, to make me feel loved and validated the, the way I need, but yet in this life circumstance, I'm just seeing it in this way, then I can basically try and, and expand the the feeling of love and come back to this wholeness. So knowing yourself means that you know how you operate, you know what influences you, you know your biases, you know what um, drives you to make certain decisions versus other decisions. It, you know what, why you see reality this way and not in this other way like this other person because we can both look at the same thing and take totally different things, right? So when you know yourself, you also know your essence, then you're limitless. You can create whatever you want. But to create in this reality, we need a, a sandbox with rules mm. in which, and toys with which we play and make this game more beautiful. 
I don't know if that makes sense. But <laughs> I love that analogy. Yeah, I love that analogy. And of course, in our in our whole upbringing and in our life story, we learn about, you know, a lack of certain things, maybe a lack of safety or a lack of love. And then it's, the yeah, and then, then we're, we go on this quest of like, instead of how can I find that in the external world, which is something we often go first to try and do and see if that fixes the, the thing. Um, and then we realize that we need to find it in ourselves first, right? And then we can, and I think that is the feeling that completeness and, and being able to expand from there, um, what you just mentioned. So it's the journey yeah. inwards that we're constantly making. I, I don't think it's ever <laughs> completely coming to an end, but um, yeah, it's, it, it's definitely helping us gain that insight. And then we need to embody it and work. Yeah, like, no, work is not, I don't think work is here the right way, but to say it, but, <laughs> uh, but we can allow it to be there and expand and 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 feel it truly feel it because it's uh, the work is really the embodiment yeah totally and and yeah like it becomes it becomes again like child like wonder because all of a sudden you know you're whole and complete yet you can't get to that wholeness type of love because of these limitations and it becomes like oh, you get curious, like, why does it feel like this to me and not in another way? And how can I make it feel differently? And then you, again, you try and and you fail and you try again. And it's just like a joyous search for, yeah, like, what feels really yeah. fulfilling in your soul. Yeah, yeah. Before we continue with the rest of the interview, I'd like to inform you on one of the programs we run at Microdosing Institute that might interest you. Our six-week microdosing intensive is the most holistic and powerful option we offer for microdosing support. 95% of participants indicate that they had a positive personal transformation in just six weeks. Additionally, many participants gained lifelong community connections and valuable tools to continue exploring and integrating insights even after the program has ended. One participant noted, the arc of the program worked well and guided us through our experiences. It was very clear from everyone sharing that we had all been through a profound process together that touched each of us deeply. To start your journey of personal transformation with microdosing, please visit the link in our show notes or head to our website. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's really about like engaging with the experience and engaging with like, sort of everything that life has to offer. Totally. And that is that is that is the teacher. Uh, I do think though. Um, I just feel that you know a bit more about yeah about about stories than I do, and I. But I do see as we you know in this microdosing community, especially when it emerged, that it was so incredibly powerful to hear other people's stories. Um, and I, I think in general, it's it's almost um, as if we need others also to see ourselves more, to understand ourselves more. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so I, really, the use, using stories of others also as a tool <laughs> to, to learn and heal ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Because we don't live in a void. We are not independent um, of one another, and we are we are mirrors for each other in the way we we trigger ourselves. I mean, each other, right? And so um, it just becomes a beautiful learning opportunity about why this feels like this to me versus for the other person. And yeah. Um, I like I like stories, and that's why I like I like listening to people's stories because I used to I'm still am, but um, I used to feel very bad for this um, a judgmental person. So uh, you know, I see something and I, I judge it right away, and <clears throat> it was very interesting to observe myself. I don't know when I started doing this, but I would like judge it and then immediately I would ask myself, okay, in what way I'm doing the same? 
And then I would see things mm. that were hidden in my blind spot. And then I started using this, um, you know, thing that my brain does automatically. Um, I stopped feeling bad for it because it will happen regardless. And then use it as a tool to know myself. Um, and I, I love it because honestly, I found some really amazing answers to the things about myself. So, <laughs> mm, mm. so just by really like being carefully, uh, being super aware every time you judge something and then see like, Hey, am I actually also doing like constantly reverting the judgment Yeah, because I, 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 I noticed... Holding I up a mirror so towards yourself. Sorry, I'm just thinking about it. It's like holding up totally. a mirror constantly like, oh, I got to do it again. Here's my mirror. Totally. Like, um, I, um, I want to think of an example. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can find one. That's a good one. Um, yeah, so, so there were... Like, for example, um, in my, my life, it happened where I needed someone else to, um, it was a collaborative project and I wanted them, like I constantly judged them for how little time and effort they would put into this creative project together. And I, I would be so upset about it, like, you know? And I would spend, you know, nights and days like thinking about it. And, and then I'm like, but oh, wait, how much time and effort am I putting into this? Like, really, like, if I look at my calendar and I'm, I'm analyzing, do I believe as much in this? Like if I was the only one working for this project, would it still be a success? Would it be a success? And the answer was no, because I was not doing it as well and it was like it shifted my, my feelings towards that person and then it also shifted how i um, put time and energy into that project uh, and it was a really good mirror because um honestly i i, I was spending too much time wasting yeah. being upset right right yeah I mean, it, I think this is this is a beautiful example also of how many learnings come with uh, doing these practice and being so mindful and aware about your own uh, behaviors and your own um, um, patterns and beliefs that it comes with a lot of side learnings. So it's like, oh, it's actually I'm spending so much energy on the wrong thing, <laughs> on, totally. the and on worrying and on the, yeah, and on the judgment itself. Yeah, and then it answers your question earlier. Is like how, why, like how much, how important it is to know yourself. It's important. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm. And I'm also thinking of um, because everything we're not aware of, you know, that is something we can also trans transfer to onto others. Like it becomes something other people see or something the you know children we bring up uh, are also that's also installed in them so we're, we're always we're never in a void we're never operating solo but we're part of this big fabric where yeah we're totally. influencing others too so the more healing we do in ourselves the more awareness we create the more yeah healthy the, the healthier the future is that we create <laughs> And I actually wanted to ask you a question about that um, because earlier you mentioned a lot about um, letting letting creativity flow. Like that was something that you got very clearly as this is why I'm here to let to create and to um, bring new things into the world and so on. And have you ever just imagined if what it would be like if you know whether it's with microdosing or with plant medicines or not, if really let's say everyone could tap into their natural abilities, their natural creativity, not having all those uh, minds standing in the way, uh, not having all these limiting beliefs standing in the way. What would that look like? Mm, oh my God, that's such a great question. <laughs> <clears throat> I think we uh, should all think more about that because then we can dream it into existence, right? Totally. And, and, 
like what we dream becomes reality, right? So we have to dream it first. I do want to mention before I even answer this question, the fact that we are all using our imagination, but we are sometimes using it to catastrophize things or to imagine, you know, to, to feed our worries. So uh, we are all thinking constantly about what could happen. But uh, as adults, we are just using it in ways that doesn't actually support us or our expansion. And so if everyone would do that, um, okay, so let me ask you this. Have you been, <clears throat> have you been around people that feel so expansive and it's because their energy, it's almost like constantly moving towards manifesting something beautiful into this world? Yeah. 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 So I, th I think like that's just life energy that um, creates more of itself to experience itself because that's all we are. We are life energy. And when we hold back where we are, in, where we are in fear, where we stay in our comfort zone, I feel like we die inside a bit. Mm -hmm. And when we dream, when we create, when we tap into what life has to offer, which is abundance and creativity and, and um, everything, it, it, we make things happen. Like even this phone came into my hands because a person like Steve Jobs imagined it and he didn't allow others to tell him that that's not possible. And so what I see in the, in the psychedelic space now, we are kind of, we're, we're kind of stuck in this healing loop, right? Mm. And trying to heal and heal and heal until there is nothing more to heal so we can actually live life. But that's not how things work. We are, we are here to experience life. And as we come to an obstacle or a limiting belief or a fear, we work through that so we can move forward and expand because that's the whole point, to expand and to create. So healing for the sake of healing is just as dangerous to our soul as, you know, a plague because it just kills us really from the inside out. Um, and if everyone would allow themselves to dream bigger and to use their creativity to solve their limitations and to break through and create the life that they envision um, in this world, then I think this world would flourish and it would be less hatred. You would have less time to focus on others and judge them and, um, you know, do all these horrible things that people do, like, you know, um, and overall, I think it would just be more like heaven on earth. <laughs> yeah. 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 What, what I, what I heard or read somewhere once was, um, you know, you can, you can think yourself into a depression or you can think yourself happy <laughs> and the amount of energy is the same so if we use our creative energy which we're oftentimes i think not fully tapping into but if we start using that to its full potential um, to create the things that we actually want and need in our life rather than to fix uh, something that wasn't already right in the beginning or that was already you know a, not a healthy situation to begin with to fix that we're sort of stuck in the same paradigm. And I think if we want to create something better, um, yeah, why not use that power that psychedelics, the potential that psychedelics have to say like, you know, wait, there are actually infinite possibilities. It is not just like, oh, we have option A, B and C, but infinite possibilities. Let's just play around with them um, and yeah, and, and, and create from there. And that will really inspire people. That will be so, you know, magnetic also to that. I, I think that is also a mechanism like a snowball that can roll and um, and generate a, a bigger movement. Um, but it probably sounds a bit hippie-ish, <laughs> but, but we see... No, I agree. And, you know. and like, think about, you know, um, meditation and why 
the Buddhists are like focusing so much on paying attention to your thoughts because your thoughts are bidding for your attention. And when you give in to a thought, you're actually giving your life energy into that. You are, and you're, then you are using your imagination to go into that world. And so, like, I, it, it was the weirdest thing that once I became aware of how I'm doing this, I used to ruminate a lot. And I used to ruminate by creating all these violent images in my head. And I could feel emotions like anger and frustration and all these things in my, and I could feel it viscerally. And then there was a moment where I, where I realized that I'm just like spinning my, my, my engine mm. on the spot. This is like lots of smoke and unnecessary heat and unnecessary, um, like I'm using so much and I feel exhausted now, right? Um, why am I doing this where I could actually pour it into something else? So I think that, you know, psychedelics in bigger journey, they, they do show you the possibilities and then also what's holding you back or how you're holding yourself back. And then microdosing can actually help you uh, create that distance, you know, together with meditation, together with other practices, create a distance between you and your thoughts and understanding like, what am I bidding towards on every single second? What thought I'm engaging and how is this making me feel in a way that's sucking my life energy? Yeah. Wow. This is so beautifully said. I was constantly thinking this is, you know, for, for microdosers, this is such a, a fundamental um, understanding and, and many people who microdose start to experience this for the first time, right? That they're actually, they know they are ruminating, but they don't know how to change it. And they don't know mm -hmm. how to create that distance. And yeah, microdosing allows people to actually, yeah, then there is some distance and they see it, they notice it. And yeah. they can see that, hey, with every thought, I'm betting on myself, on my future self, um, totally. yeah, so there, there lies that bit of freedom that you can change <laughs> the next, whatever is going to come afterwards, you can change it with your thoughts. Totally. And, and just to add to this, <clears throat> cause this sounds all like up here, that's not applicable in this world, but I want to ground it a bit in our biology because it's important to understand how this ties up with the nervous system. So I found myself ruminating more in places um, where I felt unsafe or there were a lot of stimuli that I couldn't control. So uh, one of the examples was me visiting New York and New York felt so overwhelming because of all these things happening around me. And I could f see my, my, my mind going off, like creating all these scenarios in my head. And I, I think it's important to remember that if you learn how to regulate yourself and, and get into the parasympathetic as opposed to stay in the sympathetic um, state, then you, it's much easier to create that distance and to, to create, to, to, to control your mind a bit. Right. And um, like if, if someone is ruminating a lot and if someone is, you know, having all these things that maybe look at your lifestyle, right. And see, how well are you eating or how hydrated you are or how, you know, how good care are you taking of your body? Because this is the only vessel through which we experience this reality. And so it, you, you, you can transcend and forget about it, you know? So yeah, that, that was something I wanted to bring in because it's important for people to understand the connection. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also to 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 stay uh, on the power that microdoses have over us, they can also really amplify when your nervous system is uh, deregulated, as you said it. Yeah. You know, when you're in this fight or flight mode, when you're constantly on in vigilance mode, when you're constantly switched on and you're not able to sleep well, um, that that can also and then when the thoughts are racing through your head, like microdosing can also show you that that is what's going on. Uh, and that there is totally. a need, yeah, and that that is also actually going on when you're not microdosing. It's just that you might have sort of overruled it with your patterns of, you know, powering through and showing up and life and being in the rat race or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is that, um, that keeps you going. Um, 
But uh, yes, the plant medicines so often they point towards our need to slow down because then we can actually observe, right? We can take a step back and we can see what's going on and where we're at and that the place we're at is not a healthy place or that our body needs certain things such as rest, uh, hydration, uh, a safe environment, also people that you feel safe with, people that you can actually connect with um, authentically the way you are. Like there's so many, uh, I, I feel like we can always discover more in our simply in our day-to-day -day life, we can discover um, how can I feel just a bit more safe? How can I feel just a bit more um, comfortable, good about myself, actually? Uh, how can I feel just a bit more rested? And all those small bits will also contribute. There are like small doses of medicine that you can give yourself on a daily basis. And then piling those up, that will make a bigger change over time. Totally. And, uh, <clears throat> And and just to mention is that because now probably listeners will be like, okay, so maybe I need more connection in my life. Maybe I need more, you know, healthy food. But the thing is that my need for connection is so different than yours, right? And that's why it's important to listen to yourself. And I think the the way to identify if you are on the right track or not is to see if this brings you joy and it may, it, it excites you in the process. Because I think curiosity, joy, and excitement are the signals that this is the life that in which you really thrive and maybe you do need a more you know a adrenaline filled type of work environment or life environment but that's only up to you and you have to to tune in and, and find the answer answer for yourself and that's why it goes back to this idea that we don't have the answer like you have to tune in and find that for yourself yeah yeah yeah, I love it. I mean, the answers will be generated by you. <laughs> exactly. So much, but the medicines, that the things that you can feed yourself or find in yourself um, are curiosity, joy, and excitement as a sort of a path to lead you to more answers. And and I, I like to reiterate those curiosity, joy, and excitement because it's not what we typically think of when we think of a, he a healing journey or a hero's journey even <laughs> it's not what yeah. we to think of it's like oh that's what children do or that's what i do on my vacation and it's like no <laughs> that's that's, here, that yeah. should be the day-to-day -day life and it goes back to this idea that we are consciousness we are meant to evolve and create and so in that process you are excited and joyous in you know <laughs> fighting the dragons <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I, I'm just thinking like, so we already covered a lot of things that I wanted to talk about today. Um, but just to make sure that we, um, because I, I feel that one of the biggest challenges that we all have, like seriously, it keeps coming up. Just, I think it's the way that our, you know, yeah, it's probably just the, the, the big human challenge right now. We are so mental. We are so much in our minds. We use our intellect. We rationalize our way out of everything. And it's it's really sort of the golden standard still in in society. But actually, the more and more I have these conversations, the more and more I've sat in ceremonies, the more and more... Uh, we're growing as people, many of us, we realize that we need to tap into our felt experience, into mm -hmm. the wisdom of our body. Like that's where then where our intuition opens up, like then the real knowing sort of starts. Um, and and I know that's true for you as well. Um, and in, in all the work that you do, what do you, th what would your tip be for people who say like, hmm, yeah, I'm also that rational person. And I know that accessing my emotions and my intuition is really the way to go. But how do I do that? Oh, embodiment. Um, like what do you think is really important to share here? It's not that we're going to get like a full guide or a one-on-one, <laughs> uh, one-on-one uh, <laughs> intuitive living, but what is really important here? Well, even if, even for someone who thinks that they're not intellectual and they're not cerebral, maybe do a check-in and, and, and see 
like when you make a decision or when you feel something or when you connect with someone, where in your body do you feel it? Like, do you, do you intellectualize it? Do you feel it up here? Or it, there is like a, a tingling or something visceral in your body, right? So that's even the first step for people to identify if they are disconnected from it or not. And then um, for those that are very cerebral, is oftentimes you are in fight or flight, I would say. And, and um, just lying down on the ground or um, walking through nature or even when you wash your hands, maybe like pay attention to the sensations. Try and bring your attention and awareness to the sensations you're experiencing through little things you already do in your life just to, to see how that feels. And so that's the simplest way in which you you can embody and then another thing is sometimes like it happened to me the other day i normally go to sleep at 12 and for some reason i had to go to bed at nine and i was like this doesn't make any sense but i'm gonna listen because there is nothing for me to do anymore <laughs> And so I went to bed and, and, and I was listening to, you know, some music and I did some hop and then I started like, um, you know, um, touching my skin to just to feel the sensations. And I realized that growing up, I we didn't actually show a lot of um, love through touch and how it's still missing. Because one of the questions I kept having was how do I connect more with my niece and nephew? And that that in the back of my head was still, you know, there. And so through that I found the answer. So I, I don't I, I I don't pretend that I have a, an answer, but this is what works for me. It's like doing the opposite of what my mind tells me oftentimes is the right thing to do. Mm. Mm. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, it's oftentimes that the, and we, we had another conversation today, another podcast where it also came like psychedelics also, they show you the paradox. They show you how paradoxical everything is. So yes, the answer is oftentimes the exact opposite of what you thought it was. <laughs> exactly. And, and in that fashion, I eat more intuitively and I don't judge myself for having chocolate or for having, you know, things that are deemed um, unhealthy because I know my body needs it and I never make access of it. So, um, yeah. yeah, just, yeah, just doing something that doesn't feel like, you know, makes sense. It doesn't have to make sense. No, no, no. Sometimes that becomes later or through the experience, then you get confirmed that, oh, this actually worked for me. I decide, or I still don't know why, but it works. Yeah. Exactly. Is this also is this also an approach like going back a little bit to microdosing and to the practice of microdosing? Is this also something you feel like would be beneficial that people um, approach it more intuitively? Or yeah, what is what is your uh, perspective on that? Mm -hmm. and, so, as in terms of protocols and dosing schedules and yeah, all of that. Totally. Um, so one thing I would say is that, okay, so our mind is very good at picking up patterns, but um, in comp complex patterns, and that's how kind of our intuition emerges. But that's given if we are raised in a, in a world that's natural, that's, ba that's based on natural laws, then our intuition would be founded on um, um, like a... A good foundation but because we are educating and we grew up in this artificial world we are picking up on patterns that are not necessarily attuned to the natural law and so following your intuition in this case might be not the best thing to do at the beginning so what i like to do and I also also our mind likes to confirm the biases right so what I would like, what I'd like doing to kind of hijack that tendency of our mind is to collect personal data. 
And that's why Odin was, um, you know, the journal that I created for myself because I needed to um, track exactly what was happening to me every single day for every single day for 30 days. And then I could look back and look at patterns. And then um, I noticed things that based on my memory only, I, I, I would have never noticed, right? And so I think that that set the foundation for me creating a more intuitive approach because I was um, basing it on on a good foundation. Yeah. And so, um, yes, you definitely should use microdosing intuitively, but only after you have collected personal data, you know, and you've trained or refined this intuition of yours. Yeah, yeah. Like, so first you kind of take this sort of, uh, what is it like, uh, I call it maybe like a blank canvas approach and you start collecting data like a scientist does actually like, okay, we don't know, we don't have any data, we can say anything. So I, we cannot intuitively yeah. go into a direction. Um, but then based on looking on that data that you collective, yeah, in a, in a somewhat objective way, of course, you're also valuing yourself and you're being subjective in that. Like, how do I feel? How have I slept? Uh, we're not only using trackers here, but also how we 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 rate, we self rate our uh, totally, experience. yeah. But still, yeah, like, it's more accurate when you collect some data over time. Yeah, yeah. Like one of the things that showed up for me was that um, I I'm more open and welcoming and uh, and uh, willing to listen to people's stories if I'm microdosing, and I didn't know myself to be that social or and then once I, I realized that I was like oh I can actually take advantage of this so I would microdose when I would you know go to a networking event uh, and that was definitely a subjective tracking because it was based on my experience but it just it was what was coming up for me over and over again over multiple days and I'm like uh, I was like well this seems to be true for me yeah. For at least this period of my life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really I really like that approach. And uh, yeah, and then in the end, it's all a practice. So the more we, you yeah. know, get in tune with ourselves and our bodies, the more we, we start to understand it and that we trust then our uh, more intuitive decisions as well. Um, but I'm, yeah. I'm asking this because many people come to us or they come to a microdosing community or to a coach to really say, okay, give me the recipe. You know, I want to use it for this. I have this type of anxiety. I have depression. Like what's, what's the approach? And uh, yeah. And, and, and see, that's, that type of thinking is the conditioning that we grew up in because we've been taught to think that there is a fix for everything because the the medical system is, you know, based on that approach. And so, yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah I'm going to do the same thing with everything in my life. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, true. <laughs> and then microdosing comes in as like, oh, there's this new, you know, uh, in between brackets, uh, technology that can help with this, this and this. And of course, we see now how psychedelics are implemented as a sort of newfound uh, therapeutic pathway. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, what we actually, what it actually helps doing is, is, is zoom out and get a different perspective on yourself and how you could start healing yourself. Um, yeah. yeah, with your own resources and your own tools. Yeah. I'm actually curious. I have a question for you. Um, where do you see microdosing kind of evolving in the next, you know, few years? Yeah, it's such a good question. I f feel like my uh, perspective is also shifting a bit uh, with time. Um, I do really hope that... Um, it will remain available um, outside the medical and uh, yeah, like mainstream healthcare system um, as it is now, um, because I do believe it gives people, um, if they, if they, yeah, like it takes them on a bit of a learning trajectory and it gives them the agency and so that they can 
take more ownership of their own situation, of their own life. So whether they arrive at microdosing out of a, a quest for healing or for, you know, like I'm dealing with depression, I'm looking to alleviate that, which I think is a really valid, um, you know, it's, it's a really valid reason. Or whether it's someone who says, I just feel like it could, it might help me to live an even better life and get even more in tune with myself and yeah, unlock my, my potential and so on. Um, so yeah, I think it should be available, um, hopefully uh, legally, because there's still so much struggle um, in so many places and continents where, you know, this is still a bit of a, a stigmatized practice um, and that people have to go into like illegal behavior to be able to access a microdose. So yeah, that's really what my hope is. Um, I really hope that with, you know, podcasts like this one and spreading education, I also think there is like in parallel, just educating ourselves so that and making sure that everyone can educate themselves on what these plant and fungi medicines and, and even the synthetic ones as well, what they can really do for us so that we can use the right medicines for the right reason with the right intentions. Uh, also not overdoing it, you know, thinking it's a panacea and you need to do, I don't know, six ayahuasca journeys to get over your trauma <laughs> or, you know, some people really now have, have these ideas. And um, uh, so, yeah, I, I really uh, believe in opening up the world to more education and information. Uh, hopefully we can engage everyone to you know, connect with those teachings, also with the teachings from elders, from indigenous people, from people who have really walked the path, um, you know, so deeply and for generations long, um, not only from scientists who say, hey, we've discovered something or we've, we're able to confirm something and now let's bring it into the world, but really from all those different angles, I want the education to come out and, and the microdoses to be available. Yeah. Totally. I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking me a, a question here. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that before? We I think you've covered, I think you've covered most of it. And, um, you know, just to reemphasize this idea of uh, bringing back agency into everyone's life, because mm. honestly, that's what drives the mental crisis, really, the lack of agency that we we've created for ourselves and um yeah I, yeah I, th I think this is actually a thing that that just makes us sick uh in itself mm -hmm. the fact that we have to constantly comply with all sorts of rules and regulations you know that in school we're already being taught to um and it and i don't mean that this discipline is something that is wrong i think discipline is actually really good um, but we're so conditioned into finding a job, creating a stable life, and then giving up so many of our inner freedoms also, giving up so much of our time just to, you know, yeah, just to be able to live. It's almost as if we have to earn our living as the, as, as the I same. I know, person. right? <laughs> um, and, and I think that just blocks blocks a lot of aliveness and creativity out of people and and it can make you sick i mean we're in this burnout epidemic uh it's, yeah yeah you're right yeah. yeah so yeah so hopefully that will all start to shift um you know on 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 all the different levels and um yeah that's what i'm excited to see um happening uh, hopefully in the next uh decade or so <laughs> Well, maybe we should think bigger and manifest more, <laughs> more quick change. <laughs> well, no, because I was just, I was just thinking that uh, you said, I hope that, but truth is that if you dream it, you'll have it. We just have to, to dream it. <laughs> yeah. 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 It uh, makes me think of some, of some uh, shamanic traditions, you know, some, there are some indigenous tribes and I'm honestly not very aware of um, where in the Americas there are, and maybe there are so many, but like dream, dreaming is really the work they do. Dreaming yeah. is their method. It's their tool. It's like dreaming is, is everything just like what for us is being productive or making things, engineering. They, they, 
do all the engineering through dreaming and it's yeah well because because you know our mind doesn't necessarily make the distinction between what's happening right now and what's in our mind and so um when you dream even like the, the fact that we daydream we imagine like we talked before we imagined um these possibilities and then uh with discipline but not not the discipline that we are taught in school but the actual discipline that you know back in the socrates uh, era was practiced you can collapse those dreams into reality and make them you know bring them here so it makes sense that they are you know dreaming as a way to access those um those realities and then bring them here yeah yeah <laughs> i love it. Then, it i don't know how we got to this point <laughs> <laughs> Well, because because you know you are employing the mind to dream, and then you are imbod- Im- employing the body to through discipline to embody it and manifest it here, right? So it's like the connection between the two. Because oftentimes we think that oh, dreaming is silly because uh, nothing is going to happen. Yeah, if you just use it in your mind, but if you start acting upon it, it's becoming a reality. Exactly. It's a limiting belief in itself that it's just dreaming and that's all there is. And yeah, I really, exactly. I, I mean, I was laughing because the fact that you're combining the dreaming plus the discipline as a way to create the future. I mean, this is uh, this is a gift of today of this conversation. Like I, I hadn't looked at it this way, but amazing. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that gift. Um, I think we've come pretty much to the end of our time um is there anything that you feel that we haven't talked about or any like open ends for microdosers to really understand um yeah mm-hmm. I feel complete I think I think the the only thing that I want to reemphasize cuz probably I did it today a few times but I I want to kind of conclude with this um is that through the process of using psychedelics and microdosing <clears throat> you can gain back your agency to really have the life that you want and the the limiting beliefs maybe they served you at some point to survive but they don't have to to be held and held on to so tightly you know and um, yeah just bring back your agency mm mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Um for people who um who've enjoyed this conversation and um who would like to know more about you and about the work you do, um you work specifically, you give people a lot of agency to um guide themselves on their microdosing journey. So maybe can you um share how they can connect with you and um what your offerings are in uh, for this for this community? Yeah. <clears throat> so you can find me on Instagram at microdosingguru. I mean microdosingguru and then um on my website microdosingguru.com. Um and maybe you can add uh, this in the show notes. Yes, uh, I will. <laughs> yeah, and um basically I I I reply to my emails and on Instagram so it's hello at microdosingguru.com and yeah I have an online course which is the 30 day microdosing challenge to master microdosing and your mindset um, and there are a few things in there about you know embodiment practices and breaking limiting beliefs and uh, self love um, and yeah that's pretty much what I do nowadays mm. yeah thank you Thank you. Uh we look forward to uh providing that um you also made a discount available for our community for this. So we will yeah. put this in the show notes and um yeah, invite people to uh to join and and also please to share their experiences with uh with Anna Maria and with us. I mean, that's always welcome. Like we talked a few times about the power of stories and the power of sharing your experience which is kind of always a medicine for others who are in that same situation or are looking to, you know, understand it better and get those those different perspectives. So 
I just wanted yeah. to reiterate that here. Yeah. Totally. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this beautiful conversation full of gems um, and wisdom. So thanks for sharing your personal learnings as well. Um, and to you, our dear listener, I hope this podcast was enriching for you. Um, let's keep the conversation going. Um, write in the comments what your biggest takeaways were from this conversation. And thank you for exploring microdosing with us. To keep learning more about microdosing, please subscribe to Microdosing Table Talks wherever you listen to podcasts. This is a wonderful, zero-cost way to support our initiatives at Microdosing Institute. And if you'd like to help us teach more people about this powerful practice, please consider leaving a review. Your kind words go a long way.